So I'm Etta, and this is Judith. Hi, I'm Judith. I'm the Director of Public History here at JWA, and we are very excited because today have been our inaugural uh, webinars in our new Sharing Stories, Inspiring Change Jewish Educator webinar series. We've done webinars in the past for people who have participated in our Institute for Educators, um, but for the first time, we're doing a bigger series and opening it up to the general public. So um, we're very excited to be doing that today, and we had a a good sized group this afternoon and a smaller group tonight and we're thrilled to be able to to kick this off we'll be doing three more webinars throughout the year um one on teaching with primary sources during the second week of january one uh in march on women's that'll be related to women's history month and then another um webinar on teaching strategies from the field in the second week of may um and you will be getting uh a short survey after this webinar to get some so we can get some feedback on how to do this better and also um so that we're, we're trying to figure out what the best times are and which is why we did two today and so we'll we'll be seeking your feedback on that kind of stuff um we would love to make sure that you are on our mailing list for educator information it's i know some people came to this because uh you heard about this through other channels that we had uh, announced it through but if you want to make sure you hear fr directly from the source about our professional development programs, you can sign up for Educator List at to just put the link in the chat box. So you have that there. Um, and uh, yeah, so keep your eye out for the other webinars that we'll be doing. We're really excited about launching the series. We're going to try to keep the topics kind of varied in terms of content and pedagogy, and we hope that they'll be of wide interest to people. And you should also, if there are particular topics of things that you would love to hear from us, please do let us know and um, suggest topics to us because we are very open to feedback on that as well. Great. So with no further ado, um, Judith is going to, Judith and I probably will chime in. Um, we're just going to take you briefly through our most recent education project, which is Living the Legacy. It's a Jewish social justice education project. Um, and this, we're just gonna walk you through where it is on the site and also some of the different features that, that it has. There's an incredibly large amount of content here. It's really rich, has a lot of primary sources. And um, we found that a lot of people benefit from having an intro. So that's what we're gonna give you. And also just wanna say a few words about why we created this. I know some of you already know this, but um, we really began this project because one of the things that we always heard from educators that we worked with was that they wanted more material on social justice. And um, we felt we had a lot of material that we could pull into a more organized curriculum. We also, in looking at the kind of social justice material that was out there, saw that there was a lot about the traditional roots of Jewish social justice activism and about contemporary issues and not very much about the, the kind of history in between. And, um, the historical legacy of Jewish activism. And so we wanted to fill in some of that narrative and not only fill it in, but kind of deepen it and make it more nuanced and more complicated and not just a celebratory kind of story. We wanted to celebrate the things that there are to be proud of, but we also wanted to um, provide an opportunity to really explore the challenges also so that because those are equally important in terms of learning from them. Um, and we realized also that for many young for many young Jews who are interested in social justice and social change, that providing a Jewish lens on that story would be a way of engaging them um, in a Jewish piece of that history. And it could be a way to connect to the Jewish community in a different way um, through their own interest in, in justice issues. So we developed this project. It has two main topics, one on Jews in the Civil Rights Movement and one on Jews in the Labor Movement, which you can see on the home page, as well as a video below it that kind of uh, is our little trailer that frames the project. Um, there, as Etta said, there's an incredible amount of material here. There are a total of 24 lessons and more than 150 primary sources. Everything that we do is um, rooted in primary sources. Um, so if you will go to the lit to the lesson page which you can do either by clicking the red boxes or by clicking all lessons in the right hand menu. And you'll see that there are a few units of civil rights material. We begin with material that focuses on identity issues and thinking about who we are and how who we are in the world and 
what our relationship is to our communities as, as a starting place for thinking about activism. Um, and we also try to model many different kinds of activists and kind of explore who are the different kinds of Jews who are involved in these movements in different ways beyond the people that you might think of first, you know, right away, people on the in marches and front lines, what are some other models? Um, in the labor, in the labor unit, we look at issues of work, both in terms of the organized labor movement, but also just in terms of issues of work and dignity and the role of work in our lives and the role of work for immigrants and what it meant to becoming American. Um, so there are a lot of different kind of angles that we try to get at this material. Um, we know that there's a huge amount here in terms of, we, I mean, we broke it up into lessons, but we also wanted to find a way to make it even more accessible. And so we created lesson groupings page, a lesson grouping page, which suggests different ways that you might um, gather the material for your own purposes. So for example, if you're doing um, a program on Martin Luther King, we suggest a few lessons that you might use for that. We have suggestions of lessons that you might use if you're doing service learning. We have suggestions if you're teaching Jewish values, here's the set of lessons from each that would be useful. And so we try to respond to the kinds of things that educators were asking for and help them navigate and pull together the pieces that might work nicely together for those topics. And again, we're very open to suggestions. So if you pick a few pieces and use them in your own way and feel like it was very successful, please let us know because then we can suggest that to other people as well and add that on. Um, we also know that not everybody wants to look through a detailed lesson. We will show you one lesson just to show you the kinds of um, pieces that we have. You'll see that it's quite a detailed kind of outline, both in terms of having keywords, enduring understandings, and essential questions, materials required, notes for the teacher about relate, what's going to happen in the les lesson and related resources within the curriculum, um, an introductory essay, and then a very detailed lesson plan. Um, and then also document studies and handouts that you can print off and, and use for your students. And then teaching resources um, at the bottom that are suggestions of other kinds of um, uh, sources and resources that might be useful to you as you're as you're preparing. And I'm just going to interrupt Judith to say um, that this comment field at the bottom is something that is open to everybody who uses our site. It's on many of the pages, um, and I strongly encourage those of you that do modifications, adapt this for an adult learning class, adapt it for a younger grade, find a great resource, use this comment field here to share those resources and ideas with other people who are also looking at this lesson. I see that we have a question from Hannah. Um, so um, Han is asking a question about if there's a blog or bulletin board where educators can share their ideas. So um, right now there is not. It is on our wish list of things to create as we continue to expand our professional development program. Um, but as I said, this comment area is right now the perfect place to do that for Living the Legacy. And you'll see that on several of the lessons, educators... Um, have commented saying, I used this movie, I adapted it, and I brought in this book or these primary sources. Um, this is a really great way for you all to learn from each other. And by commenting, it's all captured on that page of the lesson. So um, that is the way for us to do it now. And we know that that's something that people want. So we're working very diligently to figure out the best way to start doing some of those um, sharing pieces a little bit more effectively. I'll also just say that we do, as JWA has a blog called Jewesses with Attitude, and we do occasionally post pieces from teachers there about reflecting on work that they've done or things that have come up in their classes. So if you're interested in writing a more involved piece, which isn't so involved, it's, you know, a few paragraphs, um, please be in touch with us and we would be happy to feature something like that on, um, on our general blog. I also just want to point out that, so, you know, I sh we showed you how we have these very detailed lessons because some people really wanted that and wanted a lot of guidance in terms of thinking about how to use this material. Um, but we know that a lot of our educators also use the material much, in a much more freeform way and take primary sources from here and from there and put them together in their own ways. So you can also navigate through the material using that all primary sources link. Um, that takes you to a page where you can, there's an, a list of all the primary sources, which you can then filter by keyword or by type. So like, let's say you're looking just for the photographs or just for 
um, you know, the sermons or the speeches, um, and then also by module, so by topic of civil rights or labor. And then those, by using those filters, it would pull up the things that were exactly what you were looking for, and then you could use those um, on their own, uh, you know, apart from the lesson. The last thing that I want to point out is also that we have um, many traditional Jewish texts that we've woven in to this project alongside the historical primary sources. We really wanted to um, to use a range of different kinds of Jewish texts, both classical and historical. And so um, there are uh, a series of different texts. Sometimes they're uh, actually inside the lesson. Sometimes they're just suggested as an additional um, resource, but you can go to the traditional Jewish text page and you'll see um, you'll see a list of all of them and then you can see where they are in the curriculum and you can use them on their own or as they're embedded. Are there any questions about living the legacy before we um, move on to our activity? You can feel free to either use the chat box or just to um, jump in since we're a relatively small group tonight. I don't think we need to worry about too many people talking at once. Um, okay. Okay. Great. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to use um, a small piece as much as we can together in this virtual space. We're going to model a small piece from the labor curriculum. So in uh, labor lesson one, Bread and Roses, there is, I think I already covered it. I'll just go to it again. So I just wanted to, I didn't point this out earlier, but um, so this is where this lesson comes from. It's called the Big Ideas Activity. So I'm just going to click on this part of the lesson plan to show you where it is. Um, and it's called the Big Ideas Activity because it's the first thing in the Living the Legacy um, labor module and it's an opportunity to sort of think about what are the ideas that are bringing all of the pieces of what we talk about in this curriculum together so not just what is work um, but also what is it meaning what is its meaning what do we find meaning in work and also how does work um, our, how does labor impact our lives whether or not we are actively laboring at any given moment. So um, we're, what I'd like you to do is take a look at this grid of words here. Um, and I know a few of you have done this activity in person before, so um, I'm hoping you will chime in. But look at this grid of words and just take a minute to think uh, about any one particular word that pops out at you as being resonant or interesting when you think about it in the context of labor and what you know about the labor movement um, and about this sort of big question of work. Or it could be based on your own experience of labor, something that um, really resonates with your own experience or how, how you're feeling about your job today, essentially. Um, and just take a, a minute or 30 seconds to either, if you want to, you can write, jot down some notes to yourself um, or type some notes if you want. You can add comments in the chat box and just think for a second on these words. And then in a minute, we'll ask one or two of you to share what you found there. And when we do this activity um, in real life, um, it's much more, uh, it's much more tactile in a certain sense. We put the words on big pieces of paper around the room and people can respond to them. And then there's also the option of creating kind of a found poem out of the words that people put up and the words that people write on the on the pages. So it's, it's very kind of interactive and people move around the room. Um, so it has a nice kind of experiential quality. Obviously it's hard to do that in a webinar, but we wanted to just at least put the words out there to kind of give a sense of some of the big, um, the big themes that thread through this material. So this is an opportunity if anyone at this point wants to unmute their microphone and share their thoughts about any of these ideas that have come up. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, this is uh, Hannah. 
um, the, the word that really resonated with me was, was sustenance because it raises to me the question of what is a living wage mm -hmm. and what is sustenance and, and the relation to the whole concept uh, that's used in the liturgy of Parnasa Latova mm -hmm. and what does that really mean. Great, great. Anyone else? And I think that, I think, that, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think that that reading of sustenance also really connects to some of the major themes that we talk about here in terms of work being about, and, and the theme of Bread and Roses, work being about something that obviously feeds you immediately, but also something that per, sort of feeds the larger, our larger purpose, our larger sense of purpose. I think for me, the issue of time is really um, interesting and important. We're talking about um, when the, with the labor movement, sort of the advent of being paid by the hour and the kind of the clock regulating your life in a really particular way. And I think that right now we're also at a crossroads um, when it comes to work and time. People are working from home. People are working around the clock. And so I think that um, both for the early labor movement and for now, the issue of, um, of free time and work time um, is really important. Great. Excellent. Anyone else before we move on to the next thing? For me, work is all about dignity. Um, none of the other words actually jumped out at me except for that one, mm. because I can't really conceive of a life that doesn't involve work. I don't see how I can be a dignified human being other than you know the, the innate dignity but if you are capable of work and not working, I think you are you're actively choosing an undignified existence. Hmm. Interesting. Great. So um, the this activity is sort of emblematic of many of the activities that start the different uh, lessons in Living the Legacy. Um, we we try to start each one off with. Uh, trigger or activity. A lot of them are more tactile, although not all of them, um, to help get the juices flowing in your students' brains, um, building these connections between the historical content that they learn about in the primary sources and these bigger ideas of Jewish values and the Jewish experience and how that relates to their own lives, um, even today, not a hundred years ago. And the human experience too, and sort of thinking about where the Jewish experience and the human experience, you know, are one and where they may not be. Um, so I want to turn our conversation to the actual topic at hand, the 1902 kosher meat boycott. And um, one of the things that I like about that big ideas activity is that although it obviously, we have it located in one particular lesson, which is actually about workers in, in traditional work settings of factories, garment sweatshops, that kind of thing. When you look at the list, they actually um, can apply very broadly in terms of work, in terms of just what we are, um, our place in the world and what what our time is made up of and the kinds of things that we're doing. And I think that that's an important uh, point to bring in as we talk tonight about this particular group of immigrant Jewish activists in the early 20th century who are not probably who we would naturally think of if I asked you to think of your typical immigrant Jewish activist in that period, you know, who would we probably think of? Probably a union, you know, organizer or a worker or someone in a factory, some maybe young women who are working in garment factories, maybe people marching on a picket line. But today we're going to talk about somebody um, really different. We're going to be talking about a group of housewives who may have been the mothers of some of those kinds of workers or the wives um, who were not workers in a traditional sense in terms of being workers for a wage, but who um, definitely saw themselves as part of the market, the labor market, and who used their informal uh, neighborhood networks to organize this incredible consumer protest in 1902. So the thing that set this off was that in May of 1902, the price of kosher meat rose quite sharply from 12 cents to 18 cents a pound. And this was such an event that it, it set off this uh, kosher meat boycott that lasted nearly a month that spread throughout New York and got a great deal of attention from both the Jewish and secular press. The story begins really in early May when um, 
the small butchers responded to the price going up, um, the price of kosher meat going up by boycotting the meat wholesalers who were known as the meat trust in an attempt to lower the prices. But the small butchers weren't really prepared for a big standoff and they settled with the meat trust within about a week without achieving any kind of price reduction. So that meant that the burden of paying more for meat fell entirely to the individuals and families who were buying um, meat from these small butchers. So at this point, the housewives of the Lower East Side decided to take matters into their own hands. They knew that they had power as consumers, and they also knew that they had power as a community over one another, over their neighbors. So um, they canvassed their neighborhoods to drum up support. And in doing so, they managed to bring thousands of women into the streets on May 15th to protest and to declare a boycott. I see there's a question from Jessica um, about why the price went up so drastically. You know, it's actually a little bit hard to understand. It basically seems like it was a decision that was made by the meat wholesalers um, across the board. It may have, it, it. it's not totally clear why it happened. There may have been some kind of factor um, in terms of transportation of the meat or whatever, but it seems more like it was just a decision that they made to, um, that the market could bear more and that they were going to raise the price. And um, they were wrong about that ultimately in terms of what uh, what the market would bear and, um, and it kicked off this protest. Um, so in talking to their neighbors and in um, bringing all these women into the street for this protest, there's really quite a bit of energy that's generated. And the protesters break into butcher shops. They grab the meat out of hands of customers and throw it in the street. Some cases, they even douse it in gasoline and set it on fire. They fight physically with the police. And by the end of the night, about 70 women have been arrested and about 15 men. So this was certainly seen as a riot and described as a riot, but it was followed immediately by real organizing and strategic planning, which obviously it happened also a little bit in advance to get so many people out into the streets. So women spread through the neighborhood. They went house to house organizing their fellow housewives. They collected money um, from one another to pay the fines of people who were arrested um, and also to reimburse customers whose meat had been taken. Um, so uh, they also, at this point, set up pickets in front of each book butcher shop. So now we're going to look at, I just want to give you a sense of what that meant, right? So, you know, you can imagine there are groups of women standing in front of butcher shops in the street on the Lower East Side. Um, but what I want you to see in this map, all this is just Orchard Street in this period. You have several blocks of Orchard Street. Those red numbers indicate where there was a butcher, where there was a kosher butcher shop. So I want you to get a sense of the fact that this wasn't just like there were one or two kosher butcher shops spread through the neighborhood and there would be a small group of women picketing in front of them. You can see that on Orchard Street, there if there were groups of women picketing in front of each shop, there would be some blocks that were like walled with women picketing. You couldn't walk down Orchard Street, which is one of the main drags, um, without basically seeing women picketing on every block. So you can imagine that this created quite a presence in the neighborhood. Um, so as these picketers are, as these pickets are going on, rioting is sort of continuing, and that day more than 100 people are arrested. The boycott also spreads to the Bronx and to Harlem, where women in those neighborhoods took up organizing of their local communities. The next day was Saturday, May 17th, Shabbat. So something interesting happens that day. Um, the boycott leaders do not take a break from organizing on Shabbat. Instead, they go from synagogue to synagogue to plead their cause. And in some cases, they called upon an old tradition that said you could interrupt the Torah reading for a matter of social justice. Um, and so they came down from the women's section, they interrupted the Torah reading, they asked the men in the congregations to encourage their wives to uphold the boycott, and they asked the rabbis to, you know, support the boycott. And what's particular, I and mean, that in itself, I think, is, is a pretty um, amazing thing that these women were willing to kind of come down from the women's section and interrupt the service. What's perhaps just as amazing is that this is reported favorably both by the forward, the socialist paper, and by the Tagblatt, the orthodox paper. So the Tagblatt describes this and says, Mrs. Silver and Mrs. Kisseloff, the most effective of the committee, stopped Torah readings in the middle. At almost every stop, they were greeted with encouragement. The forward goes into a little bit more detail. They say, the women went from shul to shul to agitate. Most were greeted in a friendly way. 
Mrs. Silver urged the men for once to use their power of and he shall rule over her to the good by seeing to it that their wives wouldn't buy meat. In one shoal where Mrs. Silver and Kisseloff spoke, a man cried out that it was a chutzpah and a desecration of God's name to speak thus from the bima. Mrs. Silver replied that the Torah would pardon her. Then a congregant called out, comparing Mrs. Silver to the prophet Zechariah, who preached the truth and whose blood demanded vengeance. Um, so you can see there is some sense of what they're doing is something that is um, prophetic and important. So by the following day, most of the kosher butcher shops had given into the boycott and had closed. The boycott had also spread to Brooklyn. Um, and that night, the women decided that they could use this moment to organize and strategize further. And so they, about 500 women gathered together. They are now calling themselves the Ladies Anti-Beef Trust Association. And they established similar committees in Brooklyn and the Bronx and in East New York. Um, they continue the same kind of work that they've been doing. They organize house-to-house -house patrols and surveillance of the butcher shops. Um, and they assign committees to recruit support from other kinds of communal organizations like labor unions and mutual aid societies and to plan cooperative kosher meat stores. Um, and I have a photo, it's very grainy, uh, but there's a photo uh, of women on a street corner listening to these boycott appeals. Um, so again, I just, I bring this not because it's an excellent picture, but because it just gives you a sense of how rooted this was in the neighborhood, that women, as they're going about their daily business in the neighborhood, um, running their errands, walking around, they're, they're, they're seeing these conversations happening in the, in public spaces. Um, I was just, I think this is a good point to answer Glenn's question. Glenn asked if Jews at all mobilized non-Jews, or if this was something particular to the Jewish community. Well, this was kosher meat. So so kosher meat was pretty particular to the Jewish community. So, um, and the the butchers and, and the wholesalers are pretty much all Jews. The wholesalers are more likely to be upper class Jews, middle class and upper class Jews, likely German Jews. Um, but the butchers, and some of the butchers may have been German Jews, but mostly um, we're talking about people who are all living in the same uh, immigrant Jewish neighborhoods. Um, so at this point, the, bo the boycott's pretty effective. It's clearly all, all over the place. Um, and the male communal leaders decide that this now demands their attention. So they then decide to hold a conference of their people, about 300 people representing synagogues and mutual aid societies and unions, and they form what they call the Allied Conference for Cheap Kosher Meat, telling women to um, leave the fighting to the men. But women pretty much continued in what they had been doing. Um, overall, the boycott really met widespread support throughout the community. Rabbis spoke about the boycott from, from their pulpits. Crowds came to the courthouse to support the women who'd been arrested. Um, newspapers, as I mentioned, across this political and religious spectrum commented pretty sympathetically about the boycott. Labor unions supported. Um, and though there was some concern expressed about the role of women's leadership, basically women were not harshly criticized for what they were doing, and they were not displaced from um, the front lines. I see another question here about where Jews got their kosher meat during this. Um, actually, the that was one of the big concerns was um, was that would this would a boycott like this turn Jews away from eating kosher meat and encourage them to eat trafe meat? In fact, what people were saying is just don't eat meat. They were encouraging people not to eat meat, which was a big deal because it was that meat was a pretty central part of um, uh, of the diet at that period because it wasn't very expensive. So um, so basically people were skipping out of the meat and we're gonna play a little clip for you that explains a part of how that worked um, in a few minutes. Um, so looking at these women, there's no doubt that these are women who have a lot of chutzpah. When they are arrested and brought in front of judges, they talk back the official figures of authority. Remember again, these are mostly immigrant women. Many of them may not speak English very well um, and yet they are, you know, standing up to judges when they are in court. Um, the forward reported the following exchange between a judge and an arrested housewife. This is one of my favorites. Um, the judge says, did you throw meat on the street? And the woman says, certainly, I should have looked it in the teeth. And then the judge said, what do you know of a trust? It's no business of yours. And the woman replied, whose business is it then that our pockets are emptied? Um, and the women use different arguments in uh, appealing for sympathy and support. So. They refer to their wifely responsibilities, and yet they also express some radical sentiments. So the Tagblatt um, reports two different things that women are kind of calling out in this situation. Um, 
they say that women cried, our husbands work hard, they try their best to bring a few cents into the house, and we must manage to spend as little as possible. And they say that others responded, we will not be silent, we will overturn the world. So you see these two different impulses there, the impulse of the sort of traditional housewife who's saying, my job is to manage the money that my husband works so hard to earn. And the, the other people are saying, we, we want, you know, we will overturn the world, we want revolution. Um, it was also very clear to people living through this experience that this was a boycott that demonstrated women's power. And we have a political cartoon that illustrates that very um, specifically. Um, this is in Yiddish, obviously, there's a gate that says Basar Kasher Trust, the kosher meat trust. Um, and you see the, the it, there's a big uh, lock in the front. The woman is holding this very large key, uh, looking somewhat uh, menacingly, and it's it, the cartoon is called De Macht von Freuen, the, the power, the strength of women. So it was clear that women really were, they were holding the key here. Um, the strike lasted just under a month. It ended officially on June 5th, um, at which point the uh, price of meat returned, the retail price returned to 14 cents per pound. Um, the kosher meat cooperatives that had been established during the boycott continued to operate um, in some cases. and. Um, so the boycott overall had been a success, although its impact was not permanent. Meat prices eventually did begin to rise again. Um, but I think it's really important that as we look back at this event, we want to evaluate the boycott, not only in terms of just the very uh, topless piece about how much kosher meat costs, but also in terms of the model and how it was used. So the housewives who led this boycott were not wage earners, but they also were not apolitical figures. Um, their average age was 39. Most of them had four children, four or more children at home. Um, they understood themselves as part of a political context and as part of a family economy, and they understood that they played a really important role as domestic managers within that context. Um, the newspapers, the secular papers, really liked to portray these women as angry, spontaneous rioters. And in fact, there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment that came out in those reports sort of saying, look at this kind of crazy behavior that these immigrants bring to our streets. Um, but I don't think that's really a fair characterization of these women. Yes, there was rioting that happened, but these were also people who were political actors who were making very strategic land calculations. Um, they drew on their female neighborhood networks. They pioneered tactics of community organizing. Um, they saw themselves as partners with their wage earning husbands um, through their roles as consumers and housewives. These were women who understood how the market worked. They understood how to achieve their goal of lowering meat prices by using a boycott to manipulate supply and demand. They also, and this is one of my favorite um, pieces of the story, they used explicitly political language in their fight. They referred to themselves as strikers. Um, they called the people who broke the boycott scabs. Um, when they were having these kinds of clashes with police, with police trying to disrupt their gatherings, they, you know, stood their ground and said that they knew they had freedom of speech. And again, these are immigrants who, you know, may not even speak English very well, but they very much learned the language of political discourse in that period. Um, and, you know, over, they sustained their activism and grew their organization over the course of several weeks. They weren't frightened by arrests and um, violence. So although the Ladies Anti-Beef Trust Association did not exist past the end of the boycott, they disbanded at the end of the boycott, their, their approach to neighborhood organizing was something that continued to be used. It was used effectively again in the rent strikes of 1904 and 1907 when women again went block to block, house to house, and organized um, their neighbors, and also in the meat boycotts of 1917 and 1935. Um, the lessons that it taught about women's political potential political power also likely shaped the housewives' daughters, many of whom were working in the garment industry um, a few years later during the uprising of the 20,000 in 1909 and 1910. So while I think that these particular housewife activists were, were fairly unusual, we don't see this kind of thing happening you know, throughout history, although there are a few other times where it comes up, I think it's also really important that we not look at these women as totally you know, as a totally isolated historical incident, but rather as part of a kind of continuum of Jewish immigrant activism in this period. And particularly as we look at um, the big surge of activism in the garment industry a few years later, we see this as a prelude to that. Awesome. Thanks, Judith. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to um, play you a clip 
uh, as Judith mentioned before, of um, Dr. Annie Pollan talking about this one particular instance of how women enforce the boycott. Um, and actually, I'll take a minute just to show you. So in the curriculum in Living the Legacy, at the bottom of each, this is going to take forever, at the bottom of each page is the section called Teacher Resources. In the Teacher Resources section, you'll find links to other uh, websites with primary sources and sometimes uh, video suggestions. A lot of people like to show movies to provide some sort of context. Um, and there are lots of different pieces, not from JWA, but things that relate to the lesson. And we've suggested them here in the bottom of teacher resources. So in lesson five in the labor um, module, which is about this story of the 1902 kosher meat boycott, you'll find a few links from the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Um, and we're going to play one of them for you now. Um, so here we go. On the Lower East Side, women would often prepare a stew made with potatoes, meats, and vegetables, and beans. And because Sabbath laws prohibit the kindling of fire or turning on and off an oven, what women would do was make their pots with the, with the stew and send it to the bakeries. And the bakeries, the neighborhood bakeries, would keep their ovens on overnight on low. So that way you could have a warm meal on Saturday. They would just send their kids to pick up the chalet pot, the stew pot. And, uh, but they would not be violating the Sabbath laws. So for this boycott, what the leaders of the boycott did was advise the women to check the stew pots of their neighbors. And if they smelled meat or saw meat, they were told to call those women scabs. A scab was the worst name you could call someone in that generation. A scab was someone who was a strike breaker. Again, and in this time of labor protest and um, unions, there really was nothing worse you could call. So I think from Judith's talk and uh, from that clip that we just played, it's really interesting. This particular lesson draws some interesting parallels to our roles as consumers more generally and how that relates to um, Jewish activism, to Jewish law, um, to different Jewish values. And there are a lot of parallels that can be made um, to our lives today as Jews from this story, thinking about how do we consume things at our religious school or our synagogue or within our citywide Jewish community or even within our own families. There are a lot of connections to be made um, there and, and in many other places. So what we'd like to do now is um, explore, well, actually first, thank you, this slide reminded me, um, several of you asked questions during the conversation or do during Judith's talk that I think we answered. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, so Glenn is asking, why do we char characterize this boy cat boycott as seminal in the labor movement? Um, it seems more like a consumer movement event. Um, I don't think anyone talks about that seminal in the labor movement. It was totally forgotten about, actually, until um, uh, my mom actually wrote an article about this in the 1980s, which she only discovered this story because during the um, during the blackout in New York in 1977, when there was a good bit of looting and rioting that happened, there were a lot of articles in the Times, you know, in, in local papers in New York, uh, talking about uh, talking in very kind of well, racist terms, basically, about looters and about the kind of wild nature of these people were rioting. And um, a professor at Columbia, um, Herb Gutman, who was a social historian and a labor historian, um, pointed out that there were other, he brought out all these old articles from 1902 that use very similar language to talk about immigrants and how wild and savage they were. And they brought this terrible behavior to, um, you know, into the city. And he said, isn't it interesting that we use the same language to talk about this? You would, you could read this article from 1902 and think, think it was talking about 1977. And my mom saw that and said, wait, what is this story? I don't know anything about this story. And she did all the work to kind of uncover it. So I think part of why we included this, it's not usually taught as part of labor history, because I think most people define labor history fairly narrowly in terms of thinking about the history of 
the labor movement and union organizing and people who are engaged in wage work. And part of what we wanted to do with this, um, with this curriculum in general and with this lesson in particular was to, to kind of expand people's notions of what a worker is and what an activist is. And so, you know, in the civil rights module, we certainly do that in terms of giving many different kinds of models of activists, not just the people who we might ordinarily think of, you know, sort of on the front lines of marches. Um, and in this lesson too, we wanted to say, you know, that work happens within a whole economy that isn't just about the people who are earning wages, but is also about family and, and the decisions of made of, that are made about who goes to work and who stays home and the family economy and who manages um, the money at home and what the relationship is there. Um, and to think about also because there are such strong parallels here in terms of the language that's used that clearly these housewives are so engaged in what's happening in the labor movement that they use that language. That language is just what, what naturally comes to them in terms of framing their positions within this boycott in terms of strikers and scabs and that it applies. They certainly saw themselves in those terms, even if they weren't um, actually, you know, members of the union. So we wanted to say that um, we really want to expand that story and think as broadly as possible about the meaning of work, the meaning of uh, labor organizing, who are all the people who have learned from that, who are all the people who have also modeled different tactics, because then some of the tactics that these women kind of innovate or pioneer in certain ways then are adopted by the labor movement. So we want to kind of show that that broader story and the way that different pieces influence one another. I, yeah, and I think the secondary piece to that also is that um, many of us, especially many high school students, Jewish high school students who are learning material from this curriculum, and many of us who are working in um, academia or in white collar jobs might not necessarily identify with the laborers that we learn about in sort of the traditional labor movement, or even laborers who are participating in the quote unquote labor movement today. Um, and I think that another important aspect of this curriculum is looking at the at labor from many different angles that consumption is related to labor and that as Jews historically um, we have fallen on both on all of the different sides it's more than two sides of the labor coin as consumers as managers and owners of labor um, as laborers ourselves, as allies to laborers, and we try to draw out all of those different relationships. And I think the one last thing that I'll say about this is, um, it is also that, you know, part of the, part of our point in trying to show many different models of activism is also just to remind students that even people who seem like unlikely activists or like people who wouldn't have a lot of power were able to make change in the world and that that should remind us that we all have different kinds of power that we can use and um, and not to think that you have to be, you know, Martin Luther King to make a difference, that you can be some housewife who barely speaks English and who figures out a way to use her power along with her neighbors um, to, to change things in a community. So um, I see that we're getting close to nine o'clock and I don't want to keep everyone here um, too late on a school night. <laughs> um, so I do want to just turn the floor over to you all and I'll put, I'm doing the bad practice of putting all the questions up at the same time, but what I'd like us to think about a little bit right now is just how does this story connect to the themes that we as educators are dealing with in our classes on a week to week basis or a day to day basis um, and where might you find connections to this in the teaching that you do, whether it's through holidays or through um, different Torah portions or through some other piece in the curriculum that you teach? Um, so feel free to unmute yourself and share your ideas with us. Hi, this is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, no, I was just thinking, you know, um, I started a class last night with my eighth graders about heroes. And we talked a lot about who were heroes. And I think this would really fit in nicely because, like you said, you know, this wasn't, if you ask a hero, probably one of them would say Martin Luther King. You know, I mean, that's sort of an iconic hero that, you know, from our history. But, you know, let, letting them understand that, you know, a hero can be an immigrant housewife. A hero can be 
your mom, like whatever. I think that's really important for them to understand. Great. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, yeah, go ahead, Susan. Um, yes, I love the hero thing. Um, I put up on the board recently who is an unsung hero. Um, and this ties in, I mean, this part of it ties in nicely with that idea. So she's, you know, that's another way to look at it. Um, there's a curriculum also of people's history for the classroom based on Howard Zinn's work of people history of the United States. And they have a whole section on unsung heroes um, with uh, some handouts that can be adapted uh, for this kind of thing with discussions and questions and that sort of thing. Great, great. Thank you, Susan. A anyone else want to chime in here about curricular connections? Okay, so the last thing um, we the second to last thing, I guess, that I'd like to ask is um, if there's anything that resonated with you personally or if anyone wanted to share something that's sort of floating around in their mind as they're chewing on this story of the, um, the meat boycott. Well... Susan, did you have an idea? Yes. Well, you know, I'm uh, thinking. Sorry, we'll take Susan, then Jessica. Okay. So we're talking about these housewives, and I, you know, I loved what Judith was saying about expanding the idea of who's an activist, um, what they look like. You know, their English wasn't very good, and I'm really pulled to that comment in the beginning about dignity and what was dignified and the priorities that people make about staying home or going to work and that you can still have an impact even though you're not working or using that time to not work to be more of a social activist and change. Um, and I think that uh, that word dignity um, really comes into play. Uh, I have to disagree with if you're not, if you're able to work and you're not working not dignified. There's lots of ways to define work and labor. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that was an impact that I'm taking away with that tonight. Great. Jessica, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I'm, this isn't a very well-formulated thought, but something I've been thinking about is that um, I teach a section in my American Jewish history class about um, settlement houses and controversy around it and why Jewish um, community members might have been uncomfortable with some policies of settlement houses and why they would have been um, happy about other policies. And I talk about, um, Eddie Portnoy wrote an article for Tablet Magazine about um, riots that broke out when uh, children were being uh, vaccinated. Um, yeah. because there was a fear that they were, um, children's physical bodies were being um, violated. Um, and so I was thinking about sort of like juxtaposing the kosher meat boycott um, with this, this other kind of riot and thinking about um, kind of the idea of power being out of your hands and trying to um, take power and how sometimes that could be, um, you know, something that we admire and sometimes it could be something that we ridicule, I think, when we look back at those um, women who are, who are, were protesting against um, vaccinating uh -huh. their children, there's a kind of, um, I don't know, for me, there's like a feeling of like, oh, isn't that kind of almost like silly or ignorant? And so, um, so I was, I was thinking about um, how we might kind of pull together a variety of different resources to create a more uh -huh. vibrant picture of what protest oh, looked yeah. like. Yeah, great. That's, that's a great connection. I, I don't know if this is the same story or a different one, but there was a, a huge thing that happened around, um, I think it was like tonsillectomies and because it looked also so bloody and violent and you could misunderstand it as your child's throat being cut basically. And, um, and it, and it does teach us so much. I mean, I think that that point about settlement house workers who saw themselves as allies of, 
of the immigrant communities. They, you know, they lived in the immigrant communities. They really saw themselves as devoting their lives to helping those communities often just didn't have the right cultural approach. You know, sort of, they were just culturally a little bit off and, and accidentally condescending and um, just how much those, you know, how, how so much of what we talk about in this curriculum also is about being an ally to different groups now that Jews might be in a different place um, frequently class wise and, and, in other ways in American society um, and what it means to be an ally. And that's always such an important reminder of just, you know, sometimes we just don't, we don't know the right language to talk to one another. And there are misunderstandings across those lines that, um, that can turn a moment of solidarity into a moment of something much scarier and that there can be, that, that can provoke protests of a different kind. So it's a really interesting comparison. Great. So at this point, I just want to turn to a last couple of uh, points and places on the site that I want to point to point you points that I want to point you to. Um, the first is that these webinars are an extension of our professional development programs. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, it's really important to us to help um, get these resources out to people. Um, on the one hand, because we want people to be teaching this in their classrooms, but also because this is part of the story that we all share as American Jews. Um, and it's also sometimes challenging to do that, basing your teaching on primary source documents. So we're really trying to provide uh, both content and tools for using that content. Um, and we really, we also, I hope you know, don't see that as a one-sided uh, conversation that we get so many comments and suggestions and inspirations from you all. So um, that's a really important piece of this too. Uh, so if you want to keep up to date with information about our professional development programs and opportunities, you can always go to this URL, jwa.org slash teach slash profdev for professional development. Um, and hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll also be posting a recording of this webinar. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have a, an incredible opportunity for educators in the Natalia Tversky Educator Award. So this is an award that is given to an educator who creates their own original lesson plan using primary source documents from JWA. So this, these can be pieces from um, the Living the Legacy project. They can be pieces that you found elsewhere on our site. Um, and you basically use some of those primary sources to build a lesson where your students are really engaging with those sources and using them to study Jewish values, Jewish history, um, Jewish heroes, as was mentioned before. Um, and the so the deadline for the award this year is May 13th of 2013. So um, and you are required to submit a 30 to 60 minute video and also some your lesson plan and some examples of student work. But if you're interesting, interested in applying or if you know someone else who is interested, please, please, please contact us. I'm happy to help with uh, help talk with you about the lesson to um, be a sounding board for ideas. And we've also posted some tips and resources for planning your lesson if it isn't something that you've done before. And all of that is at jwa.org slash Tversky. Um, so as I said before, we're really glad that all of you are here and, um, we are always eager to hear your feedback and ideas. Uh, one way to give us your feedback is to take the survey that will pop up as soon as this webinar is over. So please take a minute or two to do that. And the other way is to send us an email through the website. So you can email us at jwa.org slash contact slash education. Um, and we're always here to answer your questions and also to hear your ideas and suggestions for uh, new content pieces, new pieces of professional development. And um, we are here to serve you and um, help you get the full story of the American Jewish experience into your classrooms and also to bring the experience of, of our, to bring our collective experience alive for students. Um, using primary source documents and, and looking closely at history. So um, thanks to you all for coming. We're gonna wrap up here if there aren't any more questions and um, keep your eyes peeled 
with, for announcements about the next few webinars.